disciples into every land, gather all men from the ends of your world today into one great fellowship that chooses your purpose and praises your name with one united faith, hope, and love. We need our spirits at your table and bind us together as one family together in the name of Jesus. Why do mountain climbers tie themselves to one another? 
I want to ask, why do mountain climbers tie themselves one another? Keep the sensible ones from going home. <laughs> There's no way in the world you can get me on one of those mountain sides at all. That's Fool's Needle, standing 11,487 feet high. Only more experienced mountaineers even attempt to scale the slopes. Sometime back, however, a young student who was trapped for three days on the north face of Fool's Needle. He was dangling from a narrow edge when rescuers finally found him. His hands were frozen, and later from a hospital bed, he told about his ordeal. He said, I repeated over and over to myself, I must hold on. I must hold on at any price. I must hold on. There are times in our lives, aren't there, folks, when many of us will whisper those words as well, I must hold on. There was an interesting man in the Old Testament who certainly knew what it was to hold on. His name was Job. We all heard of that Job. Listen as he offered this drama to describe Job. This is one one. In the land of us, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. Now this is an interesting twist at the very beginning of Job's story. This drama takes place in the time when it was assumed that prosperity and good fortune came as a result of a righteous lifestyle. If you were righteous, you did well. That was the idea. That was the theology. If you lived as God would have you live, you would be blessed financially, physically, and even spiritually. There are many who have the same approach to faith even today. All you got to do is turn on your TV. Some of the evangelists and we hear that same theology. Folks, I don't, I don't buy it at all. I don't know of many of Jesus' original followers who occupied beautiful and ornate mansions or had a lot of land. In fact, if you read about the disciples and the early Christians, it was the opposite. opposite. And that here we have this, we are introduced to a man who was chosen and, ex and he, to experience unbelievable pain and suffering. And the reason he was chosen to experience these tragic circumstances was he was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. That was the reason he was chosen. So they said, you know the story. In the course of a conversation between God and the fallen angel Satan, God allowed Satan to strip away from Job everything he held dear. His family, his friends, his health, and his wealth. Nothing was spared except his life. His body was covered with awful sores from his head to his foot. His friends accused him of some unknown sin, since it was an important piece of Old Testament theology that suffering was a byproduct of sin. They had to have some reason why he was being crucified in some way. But Job knew he had not committed any sin. Even God knew that. And yet there he was, desperately just hoping on. No one in this room has suffered quite like Job. But a few of us may have come close. It may be a problem with our health, a problem with someone we love, a problem in our workplace. The list is long and always personal. Whatever that problem may be, there's a battle going on. And you are not sure that you can even do it. Why does the secret of holding on when you're down to your last shred of hope? When there's no longer enough rope to pick a knot to tie on to, where do you find help at those times? Where do we find that help at that time? Well, first of all, we need to learn, and I want to emphasize the need to learn to live one day at a time. Jesus was, there was a song out of a country song, wasn't there one time, one day at a time? Jesus was giving us one of the greatest lessons of life, and he said that, well, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You may have heard about the story of the city man who went out to the country and watched the farmer sawing a log with long, even, measured strokes. The city guy said, well, here, let me, let me saw it. Let me try it. He also started out in slow, measured strokes. Before long, he started going faster, faster, wanting to get done. 
After a few moments, the frantic sawing, the stroke went crooked and the saw pinched. That's what we used to call it. City man said, Well, I guess I didn't do so well after all, did I? The farmer replied, It's because you allowed your mind to get ahead of the saw. Sometimes you and I may have a tendency to do that very thing ourselves, to let our mind get ahead of the saw. We live not in the now, but in what the, the, in what we call the terrible what if. You know what a what if is, don't you? What if the lump is cancerous? What if the business fails? What if my little daughter gets involved with the wrong kind of boy or the vice versa? The list is long. We have today's burdens, the burdens that are imagined tomorrow, and tomorrow they may never come, and I assure you, they will not be in the form you imagine them. Never all. There's an old Swedish saying that is literally translated, there's no cow on the ice. What does that mean, you know? There's no cow on the ice. Let me go ahead. It means there's nothing to worry about. A similar Swedish saying says, there's no ice on the roof. Same thing. Don't worry about something that may never happen. Of course, if there is both ice and a cow on your roof, maybe I'll worry about it. Pastor James Gordon Willoughby, I don't know how to that, but had a great illustration for helping us understand how to view the challenges and problems that worry us. Worry is things that you and I face as Christians. He said that most of us view our lives as if we are standing in the middle of a circle. Problems, challenges, fears, burdens are surrounding us and they keep pushing in, getting closer. He said that it is more accurate to picture our lives as an hourglass. There's a large bowl at the top and a large bowl at the bottom. They are connected by a thin tube that only allows one grain of sand to flow through at a time. No matter how busy, how burdened, how hectic our lives seem, we need to focus only on the challenge that is present at the moment. Not on the previous challenge. Not on the next challenge. One challenge at a time. One task at a time. One job at a time. Focus on mastering this present moment you find yourself better equipped to face the stresses of the day. I know that intellectually. I think we all do. But it's so easy to ignore Jesus' instructions and his worry. It's so easy to defend our obsession with anxiety. Something we all in some respects do. I want to read you a quote from a French bishop, whose name I can't pronounce, who lived in the 17th century, he, the guy I can't pronounce, wrote, don't worry about the future. Worry quenches the work of grace within you. The future belongs to God. He is in charge of all things. Never second guess him. You hear that? Don't worry about the future. Worry quenches the work of grace within you. The future belongs to God. He is in charge of all things. Never second guess him. Think about how true this is in our own life. Worry quenches the work of grace within us. How often we look back at some difficult time in our lives and we see overwhelming evidence that God was in control even then when we least saw it. Why didn't we see God's mercy and power work in that moment of suffering? Journey because we have worry quenches the work of grace within us. So how can we replace worry with the work of God's grace in our lives? Let go of tomorrow. Enjoy living this one moment, one day at a time. First key. Second key is remember that you're loved. The feeling of being loved is the most critical factor in our ability to function as a whole human being. When we don't feel loved, when we do not develop the emotional and psychological resources, we need to cope with life various distresses. Something that Kyle, you and I are very familiar with. It's a chat is, we see it every day. Stress that those young people have been through is 
enormous. On October 20th, 20, October 2019, Staff Sergeant Bill Gray was deployed to Afghanistan. Sergeant, Staff Sergeant Gray knew he would be gone for a, from home for close to a year. He was concerned about his seven-year-old daughter, Rosie. His absence, he knew, would be hard work. So before he left, Gray sat down and wrote 270 notes for his daughter with the instructions for his wife to place one of those notes in Rosie's bus box each day. The notes were simple words of encouragement, telling her that she was a super girl, telling her that she was smart and pretty, and telling her she, to run fast and pee and so on. But the little Rosie, every single note added up to one big message. No matter how far away her father seemed to be, his heart was there with her, and he loved her. And he wanted to be sure she knew that. Staff Sergeant Philip Gray returned home in August 2020, just three days before Rosie's eighth birthday, so he could tell her himself how much he loved her. The greatest need that we have is to love and to be loved, folks. In the absence of that love, we become stunned emotionally and psychologically. Many of us have an innate sense of dread about life, unfortunately. In reality, we don't have the psychologist, psychologist Erickson called a basic sense of trust. So we grow helpless in the face of adversity, but we panic and do some really dumb things. We don't know. Have we not heard? There is one who loves us so much that he gave his own son in our behalf. Live one day at a time, recognize that you are loved, and finally learn how to let go. It's a paradox. The best way to hold on is to let go. As someone put it, let go, let go. We need to know how to release our worries, our fears, our guilt, our anger, our resentment. There are times in our lives when we just need to let go. Final story. Author Marion Bond West tells of a time when she felt far away from God. Maybe you know the pain of walking through that season like, like this yourself. I'm sure you have. It's the middle of August. Lazy one day, and she happened to see a dog sitting on the sidewalk outside of Applebee's restaurant. Inside the restaurant, she met the dog's owner, a homeless man named Johnny. Johnny's dog was named Cheeseburger. Johnny could have found a comfortable place to stay at the homeless shelter, but the shelter didn't accept dogs. Instead, Johnny erected a tent in the woods nearby. He wouldn't want anywhere without cheeseburger. When Marion asked Johnny about his own needs, she was struck by his answer. He said, Here's the way it works. Every morning, me and cheeseburger step out of our tent and look up at the sky. And I say, Lord, we belong to you. We trust you. Take care of us another day. Thank you. And that night, when we lie down to sleep, I look out at the stars and say, We still trust you, God. And he smiled at her. As Marion drove away, she couldn't stop thinking about the deep faith and peace that Johnny radiated. It was an inner peace, inner peace that had been lacking in her own life, she realized. So at the next traffic light, she glanced up at the sky and prayed one simple little prayer. Lord, I belong to you. I trust you. Take care of me another day. Thank you. And she drove away with a fresh sense of peace she hadn't experienced in some time. Job did not have the advantage that you and I have, folks. He didn't have the life or teachings of Jesus to look at. He knew to trust in God. But he did not know how to commit God was, how committed God was to his well-being. Only Christ gives us that assurance. Live one day at a time. Remember that there's someone who loves you, upon whom you can cast your burden, learn the art of releasing your troubles, 
let go of what they thought. Now I know, intellectually, I understand all that. And, but emotionally, it's where you and I have struggled. We have, we, there's a job to do right here in many ways. We have to make, make some effort on this part to begin to let some of that stuff go and begin to trust God. And he will join us in the process, I'm convinced. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. It's always there for us. We, we appreciate it. Sometimes we, we don't want to accept it in our lives and we don't want to see it or we don't for some reason, but you're always there. You love us and you care for us. You support us. And you love us. Just because you live. And for that, we thank you. In Jesus' name.